Welcome back to HPE Discover 2021, the virtual edition. My name is Dave Vellante and you're watching theCUBE's continuous coverage of HPE's big customer event. Patrick Moorhead is here of More Insights and Strategies, the number one analyst in the research analyst business. Patrick, always a pleasure, great to see you. Dave, great to see you too. And I, and I know you're, you're up there uh, fighting for that uh, number one spot too. It's great to see you and it's, it's great to see you in the meetings that, that, that we're in, but it's even more fun to be here on the cube. I love to be on the cube and every once in a while you'll even call me a friend of the cube. Oh, un unquestionably my friend. And so, and, and I can't wait, second half. I mean, you're traveling right now. We're headed to Barcelona to Mobile World Congress later on this month. So, so we're going we're, we're gonna to see each other face to face this year, 100%. So looking forward to that. So, you know, let's get into it. Um, you know, before we get into HPE, uh, let's talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the market. We've got, you know, we, we've, we've finally, it feels like the on-prem guys are finally getting their cloud act together. Um, it, it's maybe taken a while, but we're seeing as a service models emerge. I think it's resonating with customers. This, the, the, clearly not everything's moving to the cloud. There's this hybrid model emerging. Multi-cloud is real, despite what you know, some, <laughs> some cloud players want to say. And then there's this edge, is like jump ball. What are you seeing in the marketplace? Yeah, Dave, it's as exciting as ever. And just to put in perspective, I mean, the public cloud has been around for about 10 years and still uh, only 20 around 20% of the data and 20% of the applications are there now albeit very important ones, and I'm certainly not a public cloud denier, I never have been, uh, but there, there are some missing pieces that need to come together. And you know, even five years ago, we were debating, Dave, the hybrid cloud. And, and I feel like uh, when Amazon brought out uh, Outpost, the conversation was over, right? And now what you have is cloud native folks building out hybrid and on-prem capabilities. You have the classic on-prem on folks building out uh, hybrid and as a service capabilities. And, and I really think it boils down uh, to two things. I mean, it's, it's, it's wanting to have more flexibility and uh, you know, I hate to use it because it sounds like a marketing word, but uh, agility, the abil ability to spin up things and spin down things in a very uh, quick way. And uh, you know, what they've learned, uh, the veterans also know, hey, let's do this in a way that doesn't block us in too much into a certain uh, vendor. and. You know, I've been around for a long time, Dave, and, and I'm a realist too. Well, you have to lock yourself into something. Uh, it just depends on what do you want to lock yourself into, but super exciting. And what HPE, you know, when they threw their ax in the sea uh, with GreenLake, I think it was four years ago, uh, I think really uh, started to stir the pot. You know, you mentioned the term cloud denier, but you know, and I feel like the narrative from I, I like to, the term used, I think you should use the term veteran. You know, it's, it's telling you, ours is the only industry, Patrick, where legacy is a pejorative. But, but, but so, but, but, but the, the point I want to make is I feel like there's been a lot of sort of fear from the veteran players, but, but I look at it differently. I wonder what your take is. I, the, I, think, I think I calculated that the CapEx spending uh, by the four, big four public clouds, I'm including Alibaba last year, was a hundred billion dollars. That's like a gift to the world. Here we're going to spend a hundred billion dollars like the internet. Here you go, build. And, and so, I, and I feel like companies like HPE are finally saying, yeah, we're going to build, we're going to build a layer and we're going to hide the complexity and we're going to add value on top. You know, what, do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, so I, I think it's, now I wish, I wish uh, the on-prem folks like HP, you would have done it 10 years ago, but I don't think anybody expected the cloud to be as big as it's become over the last uh, uh, 10 years. I think we saw companies like Salesforce with SaaS uh, taking off, but uh, I, I, I think it is the right direction because there are advantages uh, to having uh, workloads uh, on-prem. And if you add an as a service capability on top of, top of that, and let's say you even do a colo or a managed service, it's pretty close to being similar to the public cloud with the exception that you can't necessarily swipe a credit card for a, a bespoke uh, workload uh, if, if you're a developer and it is a little harder to, to scale out. But um, 
that is the next step uh, in, in the equation, Dave, which is uh, having, having these folks make capital expenditures, make them in a colo facility, uh, and then put a layer to swipe a credit card, and you literally have the public cloud. Yeah, so that's that's a great point, and that's where it's headed, isn't it? Um, so let's let's talk about the you know, horses on the track. A HPE, as you mentioned, yeah. I didn't realize it was four years ago. I thought it was wow, that's amazing. So I mean, everybody's followed suit. You see, Dell has announced, Cisco has announced, uh, Lenovo has announced. I think oh, IBM right. as well. So we, we so everybody's sort of following suit there. The reality is, is it's taken some time to get this stuff standardized. How, what are you seeing from, from HPE? They've made some additional announcements at Discover. What's your take on all this? Yeah, so HPE was definitely the rabbit here and, and they, they were first in the market. It was good to see uh, first off uh, some of their um, uh, announcements on, on how it's going. And they talked about uh, $4.8 billion in TCV that's been booked, 1,200 customers, over 900 partners and 95% retention. And I think that's important. Anybody who's in the lead, and and you know, I remember what AWS uh, used to do uh, with the, the slide with the amount of customers that would just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's a good way to show uh, momentum. Uh, I like the retention part too, which is 95%. And I think that that says uh, a lot. Uh, the, probably the, the more important announcements that they made is, is they talked uh, about uh, the GA of, of some of their uh, solutions on GreenLake and whether it was uh, SAP, HANA, MLOps, HPC with ANSYS and, and VDI with Citrix and NVIDIA. Uh, but they also brought more of what I would call a vertical layer. And I'm sure you've seen the verticalization of all of these cloud and as a service workloads, but uh, what they're doing with Epic with EMR and Lucis with financial payments and uh, Splunk and Intel with data and risk analysis and finally, a full stack for telco 5G. One of the one of the biggest secrets, and I covered this uh, about five years ago, is is HPE actually has a full stack that uh, Western European carriers uh, use, and they're now extending that uh, to 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 5G. And um, so more horizontal uh, and and more vertical. That was the one of the big swipes. Uh, uh, that, that I saw. There is a second though, but maybe we can talk about these. Yeah, I'll say, okay. And so, so the other piece of that, of course, is standardization, right? There, there, because there, there, there was a lot of customization leading up to this and everybody sort of, everybody always had some kind of financial game they can play and say, hey, there's a, as a service model. But this is definitely more of a standardized, scalable uh, move that HPE is making with what they call Lighthouse, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, um, and I've talked to some GreenLake uh, customers and they obviously gave it kudos or they wouldn't have, uh, HP wouldn't have served them up and they wouldn't have been buying it. But uh, they did say um, it took, it took uh, a while, took some paperwork to, uh, to get it going. It's not 100% a push button, but that's partially because HPE allows you to customize the hardware. You want uh, a one-off network adapter, HPE says yes, right? You want to integrate a different type of storage? They said yes. But with uh, GreenLake Lighthouse, it's more of a um, what you see is what you get, which by the way, is very much like the public cloud, right? You go to a public cloud uh, product sheet or order sheet, you're picking from a list and you really don't know everything that's underneath the covers aside from let's say the, the speed of the network, uh, the type uh, of the storage and, and the amount of the storage, uh, you, get, you do get to pick between, let's say an Intel processor, uh, Graviton 2 uh, or an AMD processor, you get to pick your own GPU, but that's pretty much it. And HPE Lighthouse, sorry, GreenLink Lighthouse uh, uh, is bringing, uh, I think a simplification to GreenLink that it needs to truly scale uh, beyond, let's say, the Lighthouse customers that HPE has. <laughs> well done. So, you know, and I, I hear your point about, you know, we're 10 years in, you know, plus, and, and I, to me, this is like a mandate. I mean, this is, is, okay, good. Good job, guys, about time. But if I had a, 
you know, sort of look at the, the big player. It's like we have an oligopoly here in this, in this business. It's HPE, Cisco, you got Dell, you got Lenovo, you got, uh, you know, IBM, they're all doing this. And they all have a diff little difference, you know, ways to skin a cat. That's right. And, and to your point about simplicity, it seems like HP, HPE is all in. And Tony's like, okay, here's where we're going. He announced that, you know, a while ago. So, and they seem to have done a good job with Wall Street and they got a simple model. You know, Dell's obviously a bigger portfolio, much more complicated. IBM is even more complicated than that. I don't know so much about um, Lenovo. And then Cisco, of course, has acquired a ton of SaaS companies. And sort of, they've got a, a lot of bespoke products that they're trying to put together. So they've got, but they do have SaaS models. So each of them is coming at it from a different perspective. How do you think, and, and so, and, and to the other point, we got Lighthouse, which is sort of phase one, get product market fit. Phase two now is scale, codify, standardize, and then th phase three is the moat. You know, build your unique advantage that protects your business. What do you see as HPE's sort of unique value proposition and, and moat that they can build longer term? That's a great, great question. And let me rattle off kind of what I'm seeing at some of these, these players here. So Cisco, ironically, uh, has sells the most software of any of those players uh, that, that you mentioned, uh, with the exception of, of IBM. Um, and they yeah, have more CICS, DB2, right? And have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they're the, uh, they're the number two security player uh, to, to Microsoft's number one. So, and I think their valuation on the street uh, uh, indicate, uh, you know, shows that. I feel like, uh, you know, Dell Tech is, is, a, uh, is a very broad play, right? Because not only do they have server storage, networking, and security, but they also have uh, PCs and devices. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it's a scale end to end play with a focus on VMware solutions, not exclusively, of course. Uh, and um, then you've got uh, Lenovo who, who is just getting into uh, the, the as a service uh, game and are, gosh, they're, they're doing great in hyperscale. They've got scale, they're vertically integrated. Dave. I don't know if, uh, if, if too many people talk about that, but Lenovo does a lot of their own manufacturing and they actually manufacture uh, NetApp storage solutions uh, 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 as well. So yeah, each of these folks brings a different uh, game to the table. I think with HPE, uh, what you're bringing to the table is, is nimble. Uh, when HP and HPE split, the number one thing that I said was that uh, HPE is going to have to be so much faster that it offsets the scale that Dell technology has. And to HPE's credit, although they're, I don't think we're getting credit for this in the stock market uh, yet, um, and I know you and I are both industry folks, not, not financial folks, uh, but I think their biggest thing is, is speed and the ability to move uh, faster. And that is what I've seen. As it relates to the moat, which is a, a unique uh, competitive uh, advantage. Uh, quite frankly, I, I'm still looking for that, Dave, uh, in, in, in what that is. And I think in this industry, it's, it's nearly uh, impossible. And I would posit that, that any, even the cloud folks, if you say, is there something that AWS can do that uh, Azure can't, uh, if, if it put its, put, put its mind to it or GCP, uh, I don't think so. I, I think it's more of a kind of land and expand. And I think for HPE, when it comes to high performance computing, and I'm not just talking about government installations, I'm talking about product development, uh, drug development. I think that is a, a landing place where HPE already does pretty well, can come in and expand its, its footprint. You know, that's really interesting. Um, observations. So, and I, I would agree with you. It's kind of like a, this is a copycat industry. It's like the West Coast offense, like the NFL. Oh, and, and, exactly. and so, so the, the moat comes from, you know, brand execution. It, and your other point about when HP and HPE split, that was a game changer. Cause all of a sudden you saw companies like Veeam, it was had a long-term relationship with HPE, but it, it, or HP, but then they came out of the woodworks and started to explode. And so it really opened up opportunities. So it really is yeah, around Dave, execution, isn't it? But go ahead, please. Yeah, Dave, if I had to pick something that I think HPE, HPE needs to 
always be ahead in as a service. And listen, I, you and I both know announcements don't mean delivery, uh, but uh, there is correlation between if you start four years ahead of somebody, uh, that other company is going to have to put just, I mean, they're going to have to turn that ship and, and many of its competitors are really big ships to be able to get there. So I think what Antonio needs to do is run like hell, <laughs> right? Because it, 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 I think it is in the lead and as a service holistically. Uh, doesn't mean they're going to be there forever, but they have to stay ahead. They have to add more horizontal solutions. They have to add more vertical solutions. And I believe that at some point, it does need to invest in some CapEx at somebody like an Equinix, uh, put a credit card swiper on top of that. And Dave, you, you have the public, you have the public cloud. You don't have all the availability zones, but you have a public cloud. Yeah, that's going to happen. I think you're right on. And so we see this notion of cloud expanding. It's no longer just a remote set of services eh, somewhere out in the cloud. It's like you said, Outpost was the sort of signal, okay, we're coming on-prem. Clearly the, the on-prem uh, 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 guys are connecting to the cloud. Multi-cloud exists, we know this, and then there's the edge. But, but, it, it, but that brings me to that sort of vision, right? Everybody's laying out of this, this, this seamless integration, hiding the complexity, log into my cloud, uh, and, and then life will be good. But the edge is different, right? It's not just, you know, a retail store or a racetrack. I mean, it's, there's the far edge, there's the, te the Tesla car, and there's going to be compute everywhere. And that sort of ties into the data, the data flows, you know, the real time inferencing at the edge, AI, new semiconductor models. You, you came out of the semiconductor industry, you know it inside and out. ARM is exploding, it's it dominating in the edge with, with, with Apple and Amazon Alexa and things like that. That's really where the action is. So, this is a really interesting cocktail and soup that we have going on. How do you yeah. see it? Well, and it, you know, Dave, if uh, the data, most data, I think one thing most everybody agrees on is that most of the data will be created on the edge, and whether that's a moving edge, a car, a smartphone, or uh, what I call uh, an edge data center without tile flooring, like that server that's bolted to the wall of McDonald's. Uh, when you drive through, you can see it. Uh, versus the Walmart, every Walmart has a raised tile floor. Uh, it's the edge too. Economically and performance wise, it doesn't make any sense to send all that data to the mother ships, okay? And whether that's on-prem data center or the giant public cloud. The more efficient way is to, do, is to do the compute at the closest way possible. But what it does, it does bring up challenges. The first challenge is security. If I wanted to, I could walk in and I could take that server off the McDonald's or the Shell uh, gas station wall. So I can't do that in a, a big data center. Okay, so security, physical security. Uh, is 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 a challenge. The second is you don't have the people to go in there and fix stuff that are qualified. If you have a networking problem that goes wrong at McDonald's, there's nobody there that that can help uh, that can that can help you uh, fix that. So this notion of uh, autonomy uh, and management and not keeping hypercritical data sitting out there. Uh, and it becomes, yeah, it becomes a security issue, becomes a management issue. But let me talk about the benefits though. The benefits are lower latency. You want, quick, you want answers more quickly. Uh, when that car is driving down the road and it has a 5G a V2X communication, right? Cameras can't see around corners, but that car communicating ahead that ran into the stop sign uh, can through um, V to X, talk to the car behind it and say, hey, something is going on there. You can't go to the, you can't go to the big data center in the sky uh, to make that happen. That is to be in near real time and that compute has to happen 
uh, on, on the edge. So I think this is a tremendous opportunity. And ironically, uh, the classic on-prem guys, they own this, they own this space, you know, aside from smartphones, of course. But if you look at, at compute on a light pole, uh, companies like uh, uh, Intel have built uh, complete architectures to do that. Putting compute into 5G base stations. Uh, heck, I just there was an announcement uh, uh, this week of uh, uh, Google Cloud and uh, its gaming solution uh, putting compute in a carrier edge to give lower latency to deliver a, a better experience. Yeah, so there, of course, there is no one edge, it's highly fragmented, but I'm interested in your thoughts on kind of whose stack actually can play at the edge. And I've been sort of poking uh, at HPE about this. And the one thing that comes back consistently is Aruba. We, we can take Aruba not only to the, to the near edge, but to the far edge. And, and that, do you see that as a competitive advantage? Oh gosh, yes. I mean, I would say the best acquisition uh, that HP has made in 10 years has been Aruba. I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And they also managed it in the right way. I mean, it was part of HPE, but uh, it, was, it was managed a lot more loosely than you know, a company that might get sucked into the board. And uh, I think that that paid off tremendously. Uh, they're giving uh, Cisco on the edge a, an absolute uh, run for their, their money. Uh, they're first with new technologies, but it's, it's, it's about the solution. What I love about what Aruba looks at is it's looking at entertainment solutions inside of a stadium, um, a in information solution inside of an airport, as opposed to just pushing the technology uh, forward. And then when you integrate compute uh, with, with, with Aruba, I think that's where the real magic happens. Um, most of the data on a per bit basis is actually video data. And a lot of it's uh, for uh, security, uh, for surveillance, and quite frankly, uh, people taking videos off their, off their smartphones and, and downloading video. I, I just interviewed the uh, uh, chief network officer uh, of, of T-Mobile and their number one bit of data is, is video video upload and video uh, download. But that's where the magic happens when you put that connectivity and the compute together and you can manage it in, a, um, uh, in an orderly and secure uh, fashion. While I have you, we, we don't have a ton of time here, but I, I got to pick your brain uh, about Intel, the future of Intel. I know you've been following it quite closely. You always have. Intel's fighting a, a forefront war. You got, they're battling AMD. They're battling you know, ARM slash NVIDIA. They're, they're taking on TSMC now in, in, in Foundry. And, and, and I'll add China as a, for the, yeah, the looming right. threat there. So what's your prognosis for, for Intel? Uh, I, I liked uh, Bob, the, the previous uh, CEO and I think he was doing a lot uh, of, of the right things, but I really think that customers and investors and even their ecosystem wanted somebody leading the company with a high degree of, of technical aptitude. And Pat coming, I mean, Pat had a great job at VMware. I mean, he had a great run there. Um, and, and I think it is a very positive move. I've never seen the energy uh, at Intel, probably in the last 10 years that I've seen today. I actually got a chance to, I talked with Pat. I visited Pat uh, uh, last month um, and, and talked to him about uh, pretty much everything and where he wanted to take the company, the way he looked at technology, what was important, uh, what, what's not important. But I think first off, in the world of semiconductors, there are no quick fixes, okay? Uh, Intel has a, a, a probably another two years uh, before we see what the results are. And I think 2023 for them is going to be a huge year. But even with all this competition though, Dave, they still have close to 85% market share in servers and revenue share for client computing uh, around 90%. Okay. So, uh, and, and they've built out their networking business. They built out a storage business. Um, uh, with uh, with Optane, uh, they have the the leading ADAS provider with Mobileye, and, and 
and, and listen, I, I was, I was one of Intel's biggest, I was into one of Intel's biggest, I was Intel's biggest customer when I was at Compaq. I was their biggest competitor at AMD. So, um, uh, I'm not, you know, I, obviously, uh, not overly, uh, pushing or there's just, we have to wait and see they're doing the right things. They have the right strategy. They need to execute. One of the most important things that Intel did is extend their alliance with TSMC. So in 2023, we're going to see Intel compute units, these tiles that they integrate into the larger chips called SOCs uh, be manufactured by TSMC, not exclusively, but we could see that. So literally we could have AMD three nanometer on TSMC CPU blocks competing with Intel chips with TSMC three uh, nanometer uh, CPU blocks and, and it's on. Um, uh, with regard to NVIDIA, I mean, NVIDIA is one of these companies that just keeps going, charging, charging hard. And I'm actually meeting with Jensen Wong this week uh, and um, ARM CEO Simon Seegers to talk about this opportunity. Um, and that's a company that keeps on moving. Interestingly enough, NVIDIA, uh, if the ARM deal does go through, will be the largest uh, chip licensee CPU licensee and have the largest CPU footprint on, on the planet. So here we have AMD, who's CPU and GPU and buying an FPGA company called Xilinx. Uh, you have uh, Intel, CPUs, GPUs, uh, machine learning accelerators, uh, and FPGAs. And then you've got ARM slash NVIDIA with, 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 with everything as well. Uh, we have three massive ecosystems that are going to be colliding here. And I think it's going to be great for competition, Dave. Competition is great. You know, when there's not competition in CPUs and GPUs, we know what happens, right? Uh, the beat just do, does not go on and, and we start to stagnate. And I did, I do feel like uh, the industry on CPU started to stagnate when, when Intel uh, had no competition. So bring it on. This is going to be great for, for enterprises and then customers too. And then, oh, by the way, you have the custom uh, chip providers. AWS has created no less than 15 custom semiconductors. Started with networking uh, and, and Nitro and building out an edge that surrounded the general compute. And then it moved uh, to Inferentia uh, for inference. Tranium is about to come out for training. Graviton and Graviton 2 for general purpose uh, CPU. And then you've got Apple. So innovation is huge. And you know, I, I, I love to always make fun of the software using the world. I always say, yeah, but it has to run on something. <laughs> and so I think the combination of semiconductors, software and cloud is 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 just really a magical co uh, combination real quick handicap the uh, nvidia arm acquisition what what do you, what are the odds that uh, that that they'll be successful they say it's on track you got it at two to one three to one ten to one uh, i say 75 percent yes 25 percent uh no uh china is always the the uh has been the odd odd man out for the last three years. They scuttled the Qualcomm NXP deal. You just don't know what China's going to do. I think the EU with some conditions is going to let this fly. I think the US is absolutely going to let this fly. And even though the IP will still stay over in the UK, I think the US wants to see, uh, wants to see this happen. Uh, Japan and Korea, I think will, will, will allow this. China, China's the odd man out. In a word, the future of HPE is blank. As a service. Patrick Moorhead, always a pleasure, my friend. Great to see you. Thanks so much for coming back in theCUBE. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate that. All right, everybody, stay tuned for more great coverage from HPE Discover 21. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech coverage. We'll be right back.